welcome. It is an honor to be here as we kick off the annual Your Imagination Redeemed Conference. Putting on a conference is an enormous amount of work at the best of times. Uh, it's a huge labor of love, but completely switching gears in the heart of the planning is staggering. Moving from a brick and mortar venue to an online platform is a massive effort, but as always, the Anselm team did it with dignity, grace, class, and professionalism. I can't say enough about how marvelous these people are truly. If you have the time and the inclination to encourage them for their efforts, please do so. Offer them a benediction for their faithfulness and their diligence. Well, I have the incredible honor of launching this conference with some remarks about the transformative power of art. On the other side of the screen are artists and lovers of art, and although we are scattered across the country instead of gathered together in one place, I want to first declare that we are still a community. We, you, we are part of something significant, not just significant really, essential. 20th century Orthodox priest and theologian Alexander Schmemann would call that something the life of the world. We just celebrated Easter, at which time we commemorated the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is himself the very life of the world, and who died and rose again for the sake of redeeming the life of the world. By trampling down death by death, as we say in our church's liturgy, uh, Jesus Christ brought us back from darkness and death. And when we participate in the life of Christ, we participate in that same life of the world, that same redemption of darkness by light. And that is at heart why, although scattered, we are all gathered together, figuratively speaking, I guess, on the other side of the screen. But in another sense, we're not scattered at all. But each of us is firmly rooted in his or her own place, your own private country, where you guard, keep, nurture, and sustain the life of that world. As you can see, I'm here in my home, uh, and that is a worthy work, and I commend you for it. Our Lord declared that he who gives even a cup of cold water to these little ones will not lose his reward. So... If you feel at all discouraged by the stay-at-home orders and all the trappings of the crisis that we are in, take heart, be faithful, abide in Christ, do the next good thing, you will not lose your reward. Today I'm going to talk to you about stories. Now, this is not difficult for me at all. I absolutely love stories. I believe in stories. In fact, it's not overstating it for me to say that I think that story is the most powerful force and the anchor of the world. If our hearts are tethered to the proper story, to the great story, to the unfolding story of the redemption of the world, we can never be moved. Uh, I want to talk to you about how that happens, how we are formed and healed by the larger story, uh, how we participate in the life of the world by loving that great story, finding ourselves in that story, and creating art that invites others to do the same. So first, I suppose I should tell you something about me. I fell in love with stories as a child. Uh, when I was seven years old, somewhere around there, seven, eight years old, uh, my grandfather was sick with lung cancer. And there was a lot of heaviness in my family, uh, many threads of grief and change that I didn't understand at the time, uh, not just connected with his disease, but other things too. And after a long time, my grandfather died. And this was right in the middle of the formative years of my girlhood. My parents, particularly my mother, were taken up with this event, of course, and all the tangential issues and feelings that went along with it for them. And I was lonely. Uh, my soul wasn't healthy then. I, I felt like a girl lost in darkness. I was very sad, very lonely, and I, I didn't know myself, so I really didn't understand so I wasn't allowed to watch much TV. That was a good thing, although I, I certainly would have <laughs> if I could have. Uh, so I spent a lot of time outside, and I read books. We had a lot of books in my home. My parents were both readers. And at some point during that valley of the shadow, I picked up a copy of Anne of Green Gables. I don't know how many of you have read the series of stories, uh, but I highly recommend them really for both boys and girls. And I'll say that Anne of Green Gables changed everything for me. 
Uh, I'm sure many of you at home have read the series like me. Maybe you love it for the same reasons I do. I loved it immediately because it was about a lonely, neglected child with a vivid imagination that was her escape from the long tunnel of her lonely life. And when she was adopted by Matthew and Marilla Cuthbert, she flourished, she thrived, she became embedded in a community, she developed rich and formative friendships, she was surrounded by natural beauty, she discovered teachers and mentors, or models of virtue to imitate, and most importantly, she was extravagantly loved and chosen. She was a neglected child, but, and this was essential to me, she loved what was good. <laughs> In spite of her lonely and neglected early years, she was eager to love the good, the true, and the beautiful. I, at the time, was on the verge of rejecting those things. I was becoming what C.S. Lewis called bent, turned over upon myself, crippled, twisted, uh, inward. Uh, but then I read the story of an orphan who found a home. I loved Anne's story with all of my lonely heart. I wanted to be like Anne. Now, I was raised in a Christian home. We went to church every Sunday. Uh, I was active in Awanas. Anybody remember Awanas? I could do those sword drills like a champion. Uh, my parents were devout. I knew the faith and I believed the faith. But it was Anne of Green Gables that made me fall in love with goodness. What I'm saying I guess, is that I found myself in that story. I recognized Anne's loneliness. I related to her bad qualities, her vanity, quick temper, abstraction, and carelessness. But I also identified with her capacity for love, for imagination, friendship, and delight. I found myself in her story. And because of that, the story oriented me toward the goodness within it. I think I can say with all seriousness that at that crisis moment, that essential turning point, that crucible of my life, God in his mercy sent Anne of Green Gables to keep me on the path of the salvation of my soul. Do you relate to that at all? Think of the crisis points in your lives. Uh, which stories were there with you? Which stories guided you? Lord of the Rings, the Chronicles of Narnia, Harry Potter, Pilgrim's Progress, Jane Eyre. Uh, in what stories do you find yourselves and how do they help orient you toward the kingdom of heaven? This phenomenon was so real in my life that it has become my life's work. I'm now in my 40s. I'm infinitely curious about this dynamic. How can it be that a good story can change the course of a life? What is happening there? I'm so curious about that. It seems clear that there's something of eternal significance in a good story. So what is it? I'm aware that I'm speaking to a community of artists and lovers of beauty. Uh, not all of you are writers, but I'm willing to guess that most of you are readers who love good stories. And on a deeper level, without exception, as artists and even fundamentally as humans, you are all storytellers. That is what art in its various forms does does. It tells stories. This is what it means to be human, to engage in the unfolding story of the world. This is what it means to be an artist, to fashion something from within the world of that story that communicates it to others. Deep calling to deep, from within ourselves reaching beyond ourselves. So when I talk about stories, I'm not merely talking about writing. That's only one part of telling God's story. When we look closely at the good stories and the great stories, it's not difficult to identify that they all are, without exception, telling the same story. They share common elements. The enduring stories of the world share a common plot that's analogous to the unfolding story of the redemption of creation by Christ, the true life of the world. I'm certainly not the first person to notice this, although these days it's typically called archetypal theory and it's been espoused by good scholars like professional excuse me, by like Professor and Anglican priest Northrop Fry on the one end of the spectrum and popular talking heads like Joseph Campbell, whose work influenced storyteller George Lucas, on the other. Uh, so nowadays this is mostly, frankly, a vacuous modern study, denuded of wonder and transcendence. Uh, its conclusions nearly always disconnected from the sacred truths that it reflects. However, 
The idea of the one story, the great story, the unfolding story of the world is ancient and venerable. Plato and Aristotle compared Homer's epic stories and the plays of the Greek tragedians to the divine nature. Uh, during the establishment of the church, the church fathers wrote volumes. I'm talking great tomes on the comparison between the biblical narrative and the epic narratives. Um, Medieval monks were trained as copyists to preserve the pagan stories as well as the biblical narrative. It was medieval Christians who developed the genre of allegory. The ancients and the medievals wrote endlessly about stories because they understood something that the modern world has all but lost, that stories are not merely entertainment. They are reflections. Plato, St. Paul, and C.S. Lewis called them shadows of what a culture and an individual soul believes to be the nature of reality. The connection between the biblical narrative of redemption and the stories we read, watch, and write every day is an old idea, and frankly, it's time to bring it back. <laughs> Let's talk about the common plot of a good story. Uh, stories typically have five elements to the development of their plot, and think about your favorite stories as I talk about this. Uh, the first element is creation. At the beginning of a story, there's a created world of the story, an existing society. In Anne of Green Gables, it's Green Gables, uh, in Avonlea before Anne's arrival. In Lord of the Rings, it's the Shire before the birthday party. In Narnia, it's England at the time of World War II. Uh, this created world is either idyllic, like the Shire, or flawed, like England at war. But either way, it's the creation part, and it's here that we get acclimated to the story. The second element is the fall, and this is the problem of the story, uh, the profound loneliness and disconnection of Matthew, Marilla, and Anne, uh, Sauron's search for the ring of power, the presence of the white witch in Narnia where it is always winter and never Christmas. Every story has a fall. I always tell my students, every great story has a sad part. Don't be afraid of the sad parts. The sadder, the better, frankly, which is why I advocate for scary movies and sad stories and dark stories. Give me profoundly evil bad guys, uh, profoundly tragic losses and disappointments. If you want to tell a good story, there should be a snake in the garden because that is the only way to tell the true story of the world. Uh, the third element of a good story is the rise of a hero, and this is the incarnation part. Uh, the hero can be one person or a group of people. It could be Anne, Frodo in the Fellowship of the Ring, the Four Pevensey Children. There are many heroic characters in a story, some ordinary like Anne, Edmund, and Sam Gamgee, and some extraordinary like Gandalf or Aslan or Aragorn. Uh, this is a study unto itself, but the point is that heroes must rise up to battle against the darkness brought by the fall. The fourth element of a good story is redemption, the buying back of the narrative arc from the darkness. This is the turning point when the just end becomes inevitable, and this is where the monster of the story dies. A uh, monster always dies in the same way, through the courageous and sacrificial death of a hero. Sometimes it's a literal death, uh, Aslan on the stone table, for example. Uh, most of the death, however, is metaphorical. Gandalf fighting the Balrog, or Anne's repentance in transformation when Gilbert Blythe nearly dies of typhoid fever. This death can be an act of courageous action, like the Balrog, fighting the Balrog. Or it can be an act of quiet self-emptying, like Anne's tearful night of grief and longing. Uh, looking for the moment in the story when the hero is changed from ordinary to extraordinary, from selfish to selfless, from proud to repentant. That's how you find that moment. Look not just for the death of external monsters, but internal ones. Uh, look for the defeat of the darkness. Look for the moment in the story when the monster dies, uh, when justice is inevitable, when humility triumphs. Uh, when the power of sin and death is broken. This is Good Friday, the moment of the triumph of the cross in every story. But death is never the end of redemption. There's also resurrection. In every good story, the hero does not end the story in the grave. There is a rising. After the hero lays down his or her life to defeat the monster of the story, the hero rises again to a new life, 
Aslan, of course, literally rises again. He's a direct allegory to Christ. Uh, for the stories that n are not such one-to-one -one allegories, the point still stands. Gandalf the Grey defeats the Balrog and rises as Gandalf the White. Uh, Gilbert recovers and he and Anne marry. Uh, death and resurrection. This is the most satisfying part of the story, the part when darkness gives way to light, when evil quails and crumbles in the presence of the good. This is the moment that we've been waiting for. Why? Because this is the culmination of the story of the world. It's not only the redeeming moment in the world of the story, it's also a reminder of the life of the world. Our souls respond to that. We crave it as the longing of our souls. The fifth and final element of a good story is the restoration. This is the just ending. A just ending does not have to be a happy ending. Uh, when Shakespeare's tragedies end with the stage littered with dead bodies, the ending is very satisfying, even holy, because it is just. The proper people have been rewarded and the proper ones punished. After the hero defeats the darkness, the society, the world of the story, can make itself right again, usually with the help of the hero or his representatives who remember his legacy and sacrifice if he's died or whatever. You know, Aragorn marries Arwen and rules Middle-earth with justice and peace. Uh, Gilbert and Anne marry, they have six children, and they have a beautiful ordinary life. Uh, once a king and queen in Narnia, always a king and queen in Narnia. The created world is restored, the dissonance is brought into an enduring harmony, the world is made right again. This is the restoration part of the story, and this is usually the shortest part of the story because, frankly, it's the part we know the least about. We haven't gotten there yet in the narrative of the world. The point is that, if you think about it, all of the great stories, from Winnie the Pooh to Pride and Prejudice to Hamlet to Harry Potter, they all tell this story. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. They are all little created worlds that fall and long to be redeemed. They are all mirrors into the larger story. Holy Scripture speaks here from Romans 8, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. And that, my friends, is where artists come in. We, we take that longing, that inconsolable secret, as Lewis called it, that interior recognition of the great story, and we make something out of it. I'm not an artist, per se, true confessions. By vocation, I'm more of an interpreter. I like to hold something out and say, look at this. My favorite artifacts are made by folks like y'all that are the ones that remind me that I'm part of something bigger than myself. They are the paintings, the poems, the photographs, the music, the stories that stir the veil that hangs between heaven and earth. There's no telling what will do it, which is why we need so much art. <laughs> we need you to keep reminding us that we are part of a larger story, particularly in times like these, dire times, in which we are tested and made worthy of the calling with which we have been called. I'm a classical educator by trade. Uh, specifically, I teach literature and the classics to students and teachers, uh, which means that I spend a lot of time with the world's greatest stories and a lot of time with people who are awakening to the wonder of the great stories for the first time. In my opinion, it's the best job in the world. Uh, and I've noticed a few things that I'd like to share with you as artists. First, a proper education which is what happens when we encounter the great story by many ways and means, does two things to our souls. It forms and it heals. Formation and healing, or restoration, if you want it to rhyme. Formation, restoration. Formation means taking something formless and giving it a shape, a structure, either for good or for evil, for beauty or for ugliness, for growth or decay, for usefulness or waste. God himself did this to the world. It was formless and void, and he made something good, true, beautiful, and flourishing out of it. This is what it means to form something into its proper shape and use. 
As an educator, I spend a lot of time investing in the proper formation of souls, which is, in my opinion, the only goal of a true and righteous education. <laughs> Everything else, including finding a good job, whatever that means, in the marketplace, is tangential to the true heart of education, which is the formation of wisdom and virtue through contemplating the good, the true, and the beautiful. Goodness, truth, and beauty are created first by God as the prime mover or creator, and then secondarily by human beings, who are what poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge and also author J.R.R. Tolkien called sub-creators. Just as we love because he first loved us, so we create because he first created. We imitate God by creating imitations of his world. We create reflections of his glory. When we encounter that, it is powerful, and powerful things have an impact. They form what is formless and void. This is what happened to me when I encountered Anne of Green Gables as a child. It formed me. I was being formed by hard things at the time, by trauma and loneliness, but Anne formed me toward the good. Because of this marvelous story, I believed, I knew in my knower, as an old friend once said, that I could be good too. I could love what Anne loved, nature, friendship, community, imagination, ideals, healthy ambitions. Socrates said that the goal of an education is to love what is worth loving, and Anne formed my loves. Because of that formation, to this day, there are ways in which my malleable eight-year-old soul solidified to the good that were wholly due to my encounter with that story. The second thing that a proper education, the contemplation of goodness, truth, and beauty, can do is heal. And at this point, most of us on the other side of this screen, unless you've got your kids with you, are adults. And we've already been formed. And some of us, frankly, have been malformed. Sometimes this is due to sin and resistance, but there is more to it than that. We've been malformed also by pain. At this point in our lives, we have all suffered. We've been wounded and sickened by our own sins and other sins and by the monsters in the darkness in our own stories and also by loss, grief, disappointment, and change. We don't need just to be formed, but to be reformed, restored. A few years ago, my daughter broke her arm and when she went uh, to the doctor to get it casted, the doctor had to break it just a little bit where it had begun to heal in a malformed manner uh, in order to put it back in its proper place. I remember tears just rolling down her cheeks. It hurt her so terribly badly to be healed. That's what happens to us. We must encounter a healing power that breaks open those false and those malformed healings and reforms them, restores them to health. Art can do that. That's what happened to me when I read Anne of Green Gables. I was broken at the time and bending inward. I was malforming. And the story formed me to goodness, yes, but it also was a healing balm to my soul. This has happened to me more times I can count throughout my life. Uh, for example, during the stay-at-home order, we've been watching movies as a family, probably like many of you, and we've watched our way through the Lord of the Rings series. Uh, we all had to say which is the best character and which character is the most like us because we have conversations like that in our house. Um, I said that I feel as though I'm continually making a choice uh, to be either Gollum or Frodo. The truth is that to my shame, I find the burden of sin to be my precious. I do. I wish I was a holy woman, but the truth is that I am a person greatly tempted to evil and darkness. It is only the fellowship that keeps me steadily on the road to the kingdom of God. It's only the Samwise Gamgees of my life that stand between me and the wheel of fire, as Frodo said. Seeing the dangers and the temptations of my life in the context of a larger metaphorical story is healing to me. 
Instead of being alternately self-righteous or overwhelmed, the story reminds me to pray that today I will not be treacherous, obsessive, and greedy like Gollum, but steady and humble like Frodo, bearing the ring of power to Mount Doom, where in the end I will not be the hero of the story, but simply another ordinary traveler in desperate need of rescue at the last second before I doom myself. That, this, that is the healing power of art, to remind us to repent and to pray for mercy at every step along the pilgrimage of the Christian life. So here are a few practical takeaways about the formation and healing of the great story. The first is to find yourself in the great story. Pay attention to the larger unfolding story of the redemption of the world. Right now, we have the awesome, and I mean that in the true sense of the word, privilege of collectively encountering our own communal and individual frailty and resistance through the reality of this epidemic. Personally, I've been mulling over my own participation, not only in the life of the world, but also in the death of the world. Regardless of our personal circumstances, literally every human being on the face of the earth right now is in some way experiencing the reality of the fall. We find ourselves in a moment of deep acknowledgement of the earth's groaning to be saved. This is not a small thing in a literal and a metaphorical sense, but we could miss it if we're not paying attention. One of my mentors, educator Andrew Kern, he says often that the most important thing we can learn in life is how to pay attention. So pay attention to your own place and participation in the unfolding story of the world. Pray that you'll see it everywhere because that is the true reality of life on earth. The second takeaway about the formation and healing of the great story is to be intentional about contemplating the great story in the great tradition of art, learning, and discovery. There's a lot of nonsense in this comfort-obsessed world about individuals being enough, and this is simply ridiculous. Nobody is enough on their own to offer life to the world. Even talented, hardworking people like you. Formation and healing only happens in the world through participation in the life of Christ, that we may share in his sufferings so that we may also partake of the hope of the glory that he mercifully offers as a free gift through his incarnation, death, and resurrection. Artists, I'm afraid that you are not enough on your own resources. You must be formed and healed by the great story. So do that. This is not merely an intellectual or a practical endeavor. It's a spiritual one. As an educator, I see people, oh boy, myself included, every day, (laughs) redeeming their own inadequate educations and formations every day of their lives. They're being reformed to the great story. They are reading, taking classes, writing, sketching, listening to podcasts, traveling, uh, joining guilds, learning new skills, memorizing poetry and periodic table and the Psalms, whatever. It's a beautiful, holy endeavor to cultivate wisdom and virtue by contemplating the good, the true, and the beautiful. Only then, when we are extravagantly nourished by the good, Will we flourish as artists and humans? The second takeaway has another aspect, and that is that artists need to be embedded spiritually within their own souls and within a larger community of faith, the church. You are not enough on your own. This is good news because it is an invitation to participate in the life of the world. But for many of us, that requires repentance and change. The third takeaway about the formation and healing of the great story is to tell the story. Artists, you have a real job for the life of the world, and it is to tell the true story. Make something that tells this story. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Create a world that is good where things break and fall into disarray and darkness, where somebody must lay down his or her life and be reborn, uh, where goodness and justice are restored. Some of you might create a wondrous epic world, and some of you might do this more simply, like Anne of Green Gables. Whatever kind of artist you are, be that 
wholeheartedly. Uh, what I do is me, for that I came, wrote the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins. There are many, many ways of doing the good and holy work of making art that reflects the larger story. Some of you will capture images and sounds in arrested motion. Paintings, photographs, sketches, poems, songs. Uh, these will be fragments of the great story. And that is a good, good work. Fragments can be pieced together to make a whole. They awaken wonder for the larger picture. Fragments can be contemplated. Earlier this year on the Forma podcast, I interviewed a marvelous contemporary poet named Sally Thomas, who told me that when she was a child, her mother bought her puzzles, but instead of putting them together, she used to sit in the corner and stare at one piece. And she became a poet. And that's what poets do, don't they? They take one piece of the whole and they look at it. Poets and other artists know that although it is a piece of a larger story, it's also a thing in itself something to look at and love and honor as itself. And that is also part of the good work of being an artist. Some of you are artists for children. You are primarily formation artists, uh, though many, many children need healing as well. Think about that as you make art for children. Children are full of wonder, and they need art that honors wonder. Too many children's artists try to denude the world of wonder, to make children face the real world. Uh, the problem with that nonsense is that the great story is the real world, the world shot through with magic, which is always a metaphor for God. Children need ennobling art, art that forms their souls upward like the soaring ceiling of a great cathedral. They need, for example, the Green Ember series, and I hope that you'll all participate in author S.D. Smith's talk at this conference. He gets that, and he's created a world for that, and I know many of you are doing the same. Some of you are artists for adults, and to you, I say, be mindful that you are primarily healing artists. This is serious business, even if you are a humorous artist. Uh, I think of the famous saying, be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. This is true for your art as well. Be kind, be brave, tell the true story. Do not shy away from darkness, but do not neglect the light. Your art can and should be personal. It's good to tell the story of your own brokenness and healing, but be careful not to be self-indulgent. You are not the hero of the story, but the teller of the tale, which means that you do not create only for yourself, but like Christ, you lay that down. It is all for the life of the world. In conclusion, I want to thank you for your good work, my friends. We need you. Keep making things. Keep writing and playing music and painting and sculpting. Keep reminding us that we are part of the great unfolding story of the salvation of the world. Do not grow weary, for in due time you will reap if you do not grow weary. And may the Lord remember you in his kingdom. Thank you.